London Property, home of Super Prime, where you can find informative, educational and entertaining content covering all aspects of property. Hello and welcome to London Property, the home of Super Prime. I'm your host, Farnas Fazaipo, and today we're in conversation with Catherine Simpson, who is an absolute authority on the subject of leasehold enfranchisement. We're very welcome to our show. Thank you for having me. Um, so, why don't I let you introduce yourself, Catherine? Please tell us about your experience that got you to here today. Okay, so I'm a partner at Edwin Co. I've been there uh, since 2018. Previously, I was with a firm called Lee and Pemberton's, um, which became Pemberton Greenish. And I joined them in 1993, so that's quite an auspicious date in terms of leasehold reform, having trained in the city. And I was determined uh, to go into property, absolutely determined to go into property. Of course, 1993, 91, 93, when I was training, was the last property downturn. We all remember 1992 and 15% interest rates. But I was absolutely determined to go into property. And I had to write 50 letters by hand. And I got two replies. And one was from Damien Greenish. Um, and I was brought in to do everything for the Cadogan estate. The trainee who they were giving the job to decided she was going to go travelling with her boyfriend. So it was just total serendipity and I stayed there for nearly 25 years doing everything for the estate but I began to specialise in enfranchisement in 2000 so since then have done enfranchisement and for other big estates and since moved to Edwin Co more really for um, individuals high net worth individuals anybody who owns property and has a has a an enfranchisement issue I'm there so that must have been really exciting times to be in the Cadogan estate because it was the beginning of, of the reform. Exactly. It was very, very exciting. So I got involved in a lot of 1967 Act claims, which you've, there are far fewer of those now. Um, and actually, my particular area of expertise probably is the, the 1967 Act. And, and you've got complicated basis of valuation, work very closely with valuers, um, have particular expertise in short leases. Well, we're definitely going to have to have you back on the show because there'll be so many things to talk about. But today we're going to concentrate on the white paper that came out in January 2020, which I think since the Leasehold Reform Act was introduced, all the changes that have happened have always happened in favour of the tenant, mainly, haven't they? Yeah. I mean, the whole part of the Law Commission's uh, uh, consultation was based on making enfranchisement easier and cheaper. So the first uh, report came out in uh, January 2020 and that was on options to make it uh, cheaper. The second one came out in July and that was to make the, the process much simpler and easier. And less of a game of cat and mouse because we all know, those of us who specialise in this field, that there have been so many cases um, that have gone to, to tribunal, to courts, uh, where you know landlords have fought um, on technicalities um, and the whole idea of the reforms um, in terms of the process is to stop that game of cat and mouse. And we've all played it to some degree, probably at some point. Yes, tell me about it. So there's been, uh, in, in the white paper that we're going to, going to be the subject of our discussion today, there's been about 102 amendments. So thank you for sharing that with me ahead of time. And there were some really interesting things that uh, came about. What are the main issues that you think this consultation is actually addressing? Well, when in, anybody wants to enfranchise, the first thing they're going to think about as a tenant, and I use the words landlord and tenant rather than leaseholder, it's just, it's just easier, um, is how much is it going to cost them in terms of premium or price? And very often a, a large element of that price is marriage value. If your lease has a term of 80 years or less unexpired, you're going to be hit with marriage value. And the, so I would say that the key recommendation is the potential to abolish marriage value. My view is that if it's abolished, it'll come back in some other, in some other guise. Um, but there is the programme of reform is, is not clear. There's no clear programme of reform. As part of the consultation, uh, they went to a QC, or now KC, uh, Catherine Callaghan, um, who said that, you know, potentially uh, there is uh, there's a human rights issue if landlords are not properly compensated. And, that's, that will, and you can see that that may well be something that landlords, would, the big landlords would get together and take up if there was ever um, a clear move 
programme to abolish marriage value. So we've got a long way to go because once something's decided, then you might actually have a group of people getting together and saying, no, we don't want to accept that. So it's, 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 it's a long road that we're, we're, exactly. we're facing. I could, I could see that happening. The consultation paper is, is addressing some issues. So is the valuation the biggest issue? I, I think it is because it's what people think, first think of when they're going to extend. They think, how much is it going to cost me? And what do you think is the worst thing that it's, it's addressing the consultation paper? I mean, in terms of the valuation, there are, there are basically there are, there are seven sub options and they've got, you've got the options to remove marriage value or to have hope value or to abolish it altogether. And you've got seven sub options and there's, some of them replicate what happens at the moment. For example, you disregard tenants improvements, you give a discount uh, for holding over at the end of the term. And there is, there is a, a thought about having a 0.1% cap on uh, capitalising uh, uh, the, the ground rent, which I think is unfair. If you have an onerous ground rent, and an onerous ground rent is generally considered to be one that is 0.1% uh, of freehold value, um, then that should be capitalised uh, to, to, to assess uh, the loss uh, payable to the landlord. It shouldn't be capped. In regards to lease extensions, what are the main proposed changes? Okay, that you have a uniform right for houses and flats. So you don't have this thing where you had to say, is it a house? And we know there's been so much litigation about what is a house, a seemingly simple concept, or a flat, less litigation about flats. You've got this uniform concept of, of, a, of, a, of a dwelling unit. So right to extend your lease for 990 years, so 990 years, which seems like an odd figure. Currently it's 90 years, but that's because they're going to throw out the uh, redevelopment to, to every last five years of every, of every 90 years, which is why you, you get to 990. And that's going to be at zero ground rent and very strictly on the same terms as the existing lease. And what does the redevelopment uh, clause mean? That entitles the landlord to get possession of the, the dwelling um, if he intends to redevelop the premises. So he has it's a redevelopment right and that will be exercisable in the last five years of the extended term. And currently that's... Cur currently you, you're entitled to a 90 year extension and a landlord has a redevelopment break in the last 12 months of the original term. I think that's probably still intended to apply. And then in the last five years of the 90 year extended term. But if it's been granted 990 years, uh, the last five year redevelopment attaches to each tranche of 90 years. That's the idea behind that. And what does the landlord have to do in order to qualify to exercise that right? He has to show that he has an intention to, to redevelop the whole or part of the premises, the building in which the premises are contained. So that means planning yes, approved, get planning permission, money in place, yes, etc. A settled intention. Okay. And um, is there anything else being proposed for leaseholders? So how long they own it for or things like that? So the plan is to remove the two year qualifying the ownership requirement, um, which doesn't currently exist in, if you're doing a collective claim, you don't have a two year ownership requirement. You can join in as soon as you buy a flat in a building, but it does currently attach to uh, claiming a freehold of your house or an extended lease of your house or an extended lease of your, of your flat. So that two year ownership is going to be removed. So it's going to bring it more in line with the collective enfranchisement so that you kind of start on the same footing exactly. as an individual. Exactly. And it removes the whole technicality of selling something with the benefit of a claim because as the seller, you're the one with the two-year ownership, your new buyer doesn't have it. And it's a, it's a trap for many people. It goes wrong. Um, and again, it just encourages landlords to play, to play cat and mouse with people. So you remove that element of uncertainty and potential for error. So, so we, we're, dis we're discussing the, the leasehold and then the collective enfranchisement is when a group of uh, owners, so h how does that work? What do the they have to qualify of, in order to do right, that? Yes, yeah, so you have a group of tenants, I'll call them tenants, who all own long leases in a building. They can get together to claim their freehold. So a long lease is a lease of more than 21 years. So that would be the qualifying interest. And as I've said, with collective claims, you don't need to have owned your flat for two years. But there are other restrictions on collective claims. Um, not everybody is, is, can join in, is, can be invited to join in. If, if, you, if you're not needed for numbers, 
uh, then you can be left out by your fellow leaseholders. So now there's going to be a right to participate if you want to. Um, currently, there's a, a limit of 25% commercial uh, premises in a building with, with, which is in mixed use. If, it, if the commercial uh, parts exceed 25% of the internal floor area of the building taken as a whole but excluding common parts, you're not going to qualify. That's going to be raised to 50%, or well, that's the plan. Um, the disqualification that if you own three or more flats in a building, you don't have a qualifying interest, that is going to go. So there's quite a lot of, of, of intended changes. Um, and there are also some ones that, you know, are intended to cure quite unpleasant ills of, of collective claims. For example, um, if you have a commercial building, and there's, but it's not more than 25%, so you still qualify. Um, landlords who really don't want to let go of the freehold will make it Im impossible for tenants um, to claim the freehold in, in financial terms by not seeking leasebacks of, of the commercial parts, which they are entitled to do so that they still get their income from their shop or art gallery or whatever it is. But some of them will actually deliberately not counter-propose a leaseback because they know uh, that the tenants just won't have funds to cover off the commercial element of the building. So um, another thing that I uh, came across in the white uh, paper was fleece hold and I'd never heard of fleece hold. So is that something you just addressed or is that something else? I, no, I know about fleece hold and actually I'm sure it's probably going to find its way into the into the Oxford English Dictionary. In fact, I googled it and yes, it, 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 it's basically a reference to, to very onerous uh, terms, typically in, in, in transfers of freehold houses um, or, or leasehold houses that developers put in uh, that meant that, you know, you had an absolute bar against alterations, which meant that if you wanted even to hang a picture on the wall, uh, your landlord would, could charge you, you know, ridiculous amounts of money. So that's where the term came from. I think it was actually coined by uh, an, an old friend of mine who sadly passed away called Louis Burns, who was very well known for championing leaseholders' rights all over the country, particularly people who had bought freehold houses from developers with onerous doubling ground rents you know, very innocently had no idea that they had these onerous rents and, and onerous service charges and, and payments for all these permissions. So that's where it came from. And this is actually a topic that's been quite important in encouraging reforms, isn't it? Yes. Because the developers were taking quite a lot of advantage of, of some of these potential loopholes. Exactly. So the developers were, were, were well known for you know, particularly on you know small ho housing estates all over the country, um, selling freehold houses, and that is something that, I, that it will, I'm sure, be abolished. Freehold houses um, with these onerous rents, um, but and of course we've since then we've had in the summer we had the uh, leaseholder form ground rent act 2022, which is means that whenever you grant a new long lease or a house or a flat, the rent has got to be. Uh, a peppercorn, zero, zero ground rents. Of course, that doesn't help existing leaseholders, many of whom are still stuck with these onerous rents. And the Competition and Markets Authority is conducting an investigation into all of these developers who granted leases in these terms, some of whom have sold on to pension funds, and, and there, a lot of them are actually agreeing to uh, remove the doubling ground rent provisions to something more palatable. So just voluntarily yes, agreeing because, to do it. Because otherwise they may well face um, um, litigation, which would be expensive and reputationally disastrous. Um, so we talked about collective enfranchisement and some of the reforms that uh, are, are being proposed. Now, some landlords are actually exempt from having to sell their lease uh, extensions. Who are these landlords? Well, typically one thinks of the Crown and uh, the uh, National Trust. So the Crown is basically exempt from the legislation, except there's a parliamentary undertaking which says they will be bound by it, by analogy, except in certain areas which are known as accepted areas, and those are the areas of particular sort of historical importance to the Crown. So they will grant uh, extended leases. Um, the National Trust will only grant 50-year um, extensions. Um, as far as I can see from the Law Commission's reports, I don't think there is a plan to change um, the, the Crown's position. So the National Trust um, 
may be obliged to sell freeholds pursuant to statutory claims, but with an option uh, to buy the freehold back if the claimant sometime in the future wants to sell. And they have to go back to the National Trust, yes. they can't sell it to an outside... It will be a right of, effectively a right of first refusal for National Trust, because they've got their heritage properties in many cases. Can you please explain to our listeners what are the costs associated with buying a lease extension or getting a collective enfranchisement and what are the proposed changes to make that better? So currently obviously claimant tenants pay their own legal and valuation costs incurred in connection with the claim but they are also obliged to pay the landlord's recoverable legal and valuation costs incurred in that process not their negotiation costs and not any costs that they incur in going to the tribunal if tribunal proceedings are required or if court proceedings are required for whatever reason. Um, and, you know, these costs can be high. Um, the plan now is for there to be no contribution towards landlord's costs if a valuation methodology is adopted. So, in other words, if there can be no discussion about valuation, it is simply, you know, a method and you punch the numbers in and that's the answer, there will, there will be no obligation for the tenants then to pay the landlord's costs. Um, if, that, if there isn't that methodology um, and valuation is still a bit of a free-for-all, um, then there's going to be probably a, a fixed cost regime. There were murmurings about uh, landlords not being able to recover any of their costs at all uh, from the tenant. And I, I, I feel that's unfair because landlords don't ask to have these claims made against them. And it, it's, that, that whole thought is predicated on, you know, the, the big grand landlords. No, there are plenty of, of, of small landlords. You know, the little old lady who's, in, who's inherited a house that's divided into flats and, and, and she's, so she's got tenants in the building. Why should she have to pay uh, their costs if they decide to claim the freehold or extended leases against her? And there's something else in legislation which uh, puts the onus on the tenant to get the offer that they make to the landlord has to be accurate or their notice is invalid, whereas the landlord can say whatever counterclaim that they want to, to say, which then brings in a whole load of other professionals who are going to rack up the cost while they negotiate this discrepancy. So yeah. that's something that's going to be addressed with the, the whole process valuation going, reform. I think, that, yes, I mean, that's, that would be part of the whole process of, of the reforms in terms of making it easier and simpler. So there are less traps for tenants to fall into, and you're absolutely right. If, if a tenant makes a counter, an opening proposal that is so low as to not be regarded to have been made in good faith, they run the risk of the landlord arguing that the notice is invalid. Then, of course, you have all sorts of toing and froing, expensive arguments, um, and it can become a bit of a war of attrition, and, as I say, a game of cat and mouse. Another thing is that um, landlords can actually also voluntarily go into negotiations to sell their lease extensions. Yes. And if a landlord goes voluntarily into such a discussion, then they're taxed differently, is that right? Yes. I mean, many of the, of the uh, large estates will, will not enter into voluntary transactions because uh, they won't be able to benefit from um, rollover relief on the capital gain that obviously is realised when, when in, in the premium paid. And if that, if that gain is, is, is reinvested, if the premium is reinvested, um, then um, you get rollover relief, but you don't get it if it's a voluntary transaction. It's really a fascinating area, isn't it? There's so it's many different things. So that many facets to it. We're pulling. So, so what do you think is the history of uh, leaseholds? How, how, how could they have come about? Why did they come about? Well, I, uh, people talk about it being feudal and medieval and it doesn't exist on the continent. Why does it exist here? I have a theory um, that it, it may in, in partly be due to our inheritance uh, laws where we have this rule of primogeniture where the eldest son inherits, inherits the land, the second son you know, goes into the army, the third one goes into the church, which means that unlike in France, for example, um, land is not broken down and shared amongst people amongst the family, so you have somebody who effectively is burdened and and I am of the view that the leasehold system began in part uh, by landlords who needed to um, have some income um, 
in order to look after their property. So the easiest thing to do was to grant long leases for premiums um, so that they could then have some money uh, to, to, to look after the property. And of course, at a time after the First World War, when lots of rent uh, restrictions came into force, uh, the income was, was dwindling. So the easiest thing to do was sell long leases at premiums. I guess on the flip side, to, to be fair to landlords, and I think you touched on the subject of human rights, that if you don't actually cover all the bases when you come to giving the right to the tenant, and then you shortchange the landlord when they have to sell long leases, etc., you've got to make sure that they're paid everything that they're due. You've got to be properly compensated. Otherwise, there are, there, you know, there are human rights issues. Absolutely. Talking about voluntary transactions, so we've discussed the, ta the tax issue, but voluntary um, transactions when it comes to freehold houses, can you tell us more about that? Well, it would apply to freehold houses or, 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 or leases. If somebody's extending their lease, voluntary transactions of contracting out are going to need approval by the tribunal. Um, so any agreement purporting to exclude or restrict rights is going to be void and has to have the approval of, of the tribunal. So you can't have landlords forcing, pressurising tenants into doing deals on, on extended leases or, or freehold claims. They have to be approved by the tribunal. But at the moment, you can just have a voluntary deal. But as a tenant, you might, you might be fleeced by your landlord. So we had the white paper come out in January 2020. And in January 2021, uh, after a period of consultation, the government came back with some proposals. So what are those high level discussions, what, what, what do they okay. mean for us? So, so having looked at both of the Law Commission's reports, so the one in January 2020 on making enfranchisement easier and cheaper, um, and then there's the one in July to make enfranchisement easier, which is more on the process side. The government came back on the 7th of January 2021 with its announcements for reform. I mean, nothing has happened and there is no clear timetable or programme for reform as things currently stand, but they distilled the recommendations and they particularly um, highlighted the uh, proposal for a right to extend your lease uh, to 999 years um, at a peppercorn rent. Um, reduce costs, abolition of marriage value, zero ground rent on all new leases, which has now happened because, as I said, we have the 2022 Act, prescribed rates for the capitalisation rate, deferment rate and relativity, which will form part of the, of the calculation uh, methodology, uh, restriction on development value, um, an online calculator and uh, a common hold council to discuss common hold. So those are the the things that they, they picked out. But as I say, nothing, nothing has happened since then. Well, exciting times when they do happen, so we can see how the market uh, takes those on board. And uh, we would love to welcome you back and talk to you again. We'd love to come back. Thank you, Fiona. Thank you very much for talking to us. And uh, to listen to Catherine and other experts who we have discussions with on various aspects of the real estate uh, market, please head over to our platform and uh, choose from our list of podcasts with experts like Catherine. Thanks for listening to the London Property Podcast. Head over to londonproperty.co.uk and subscribe to our newsletter to receive latest updates.